Hello and welcome. My name is Kesha Palm and I'm the artistic producer of the Paprika Theater Festival. And my name is Julia Dixon and I am the general manager of the festival. The play excerpt that you were about to experience was developed and presented at the Paprika Theater Festival. Paprika is a youth-led, award-winning performing arts company offering paid hands-on professional development opportunities to emerging artists, 18 to 30, in the greater Toronto area. Today and for over 23 years, Paprika operates from offices, theaters, coffee shops, houses, apartments, bedrooms, and kitchen tables all across Digerundo. We acknowledge the ancestral lands and waterways of the Anishinaabe, including the treaty holders of this territory, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee peoples from the Six Nations Confederacy of the Grand River, Wendat, and any other nations who cared for the land, acknowledged and unacknowledged, recorded and unrecorded, past, present, and future. Much of Paprika's programming and operations also takes place online. And even now, we are using equipment and high-speed internet not available in many rural and Indigenous communities in order to reach you through this digital presentation. We recognize that the technologies and devices bringing us together while physically apart hold precious materials that come from these lands and have significant carbon footprints that contribute to the changing climates disproportionately affecting Indigenous peoples worldwide. We continue to learn, unlearn, shift perspectives, embody and practice teachings of this land, including the Dish with Once Bloom Wampum Covenant, a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land, and the Seventh Generation Principle, a Haudenosaunee teaching that decisions that teaches the decisions that we make today should protect and safeguard the land and water for seven generations to come. We are so grateful to call this land home. Please enjoy the Paprika Festival Playwrights Unit staged readings, where we celebrate works in process by Dean Vukovic, Willow Martin, and Teja Shane Chung, developed with support from facilitator Bilal Bag from November 2022 to May 2023. The recordings made on May 21st, 2023 at Native Earth Performing Arts Aki Studio in Dugarondo, with equipment provided in kind from Charles Street Video and Theatre Pass Marai, and featuring lighting design by Paprika Design Lab participant Max Cameron Fearon. Yay. Yay! This presentation would not be possible without our lead lab and digital presentation partner at the Stratford Festival, the partners we just listed, and the community of donors and partners and staff who keep Paprika running. If you would like to join the community of supporters who make this work possible, you can become a monthly donor or make a one-time donation following the link below or by heading to our website, paprikafestival.com support. Now get comfortable. Settle in and please enjoy. Hello, my name is Tasia Shanae Chung and I am the playwright for Misfortune 2023. Misfortune 2023 is a play about a pageant where instead of the criteria being if you have the most beauty and grace and elegance, the contestants are judged on whether they were able to exist correctly within an abusive situation, which is already a losing game. It's a bit of a farce and a satire on the expectations that are put on victims of abusive situations. The content warnings for this play include strong language and depictions of sexual abuse. I hope you enjoy this reading of Misfortune 2023. Intro, chosen. A dark and empty stage. We hear the low hum and buzz of a live sound stage. Nervous heels tapping the ground. Audience whispering in their seats. Voices over walkie-talkies slowly become more audible, as if waking from a dream. Above it all, we hear a mother's voice. It starts with all 16 of you on stage. This is when they get their first impression of you, so you have to be careful. Dress modestly enough that they couldn't possibly imagine you getting drunk in a club or... Our charismatic host, Maxwell Chandler, enters with the confidence of a man who has owned this stage for years. He's all smiles as he waits for the, for the applause to die down. Hello and good evening! It is my pleasure, nay, my honor to be hosting the 50th Annual Misfortune Pageant. What a pleasure it is to be a part of your home every year as we answer the age-old question, 
Should we believe women? <laughs> A joke, of course. Now, let me ask you a serious question. How much did you enjoy that opening performance? Yeah, give it up for Kid Rock for kicking off what I expect to be our best pageant yet. Tonight, as with every year, we are celebrating women. That's right, can we make some noise for women? Tonight, we crown a new misfortune. Tonight, one of these ladies will win something most people dream of their entire lives. That's right. We're not like those other pageants with their cash prizes and their brand deals. We offer something much more valuable for the world to unite as one, to hear, see, and understand you in your darkest moment. And you may notice that the competition this year looks a little different. So that's right. After 49 years of competition, 49 years of fans' devotion and passion. We also had 49 years of uh, critique to really unpack. <laughs> I know, I know. But hey, we can't live in the past. The world is changing and so must we. Tonight, a rainbow of women will grace our stage. And I'm not just talking about the LGBTs, no. <laughs> this year, we opened our pageant up to women of all stars and stripes. Now, for the chance to make it onto our show tonight, our contestants went through a preliminary athletic wear and interview competition. <laughs> Since, of course, a big part of what makes a winner in this competition is communication and using your voice. Our distinct panel whittled the competition down to the top 15 you see with us tonight. And to round up, our top 16 is the contestant you fans voted for using our Miss Fortune app. <laughs> Coming up, we'll meet our distinguished panel of judges and much, much more. But first, a message from our sponsors. <laughs> the applause sign lights up and the audience obeys. The first AD gives the all clear on set and that they're off the air for two minutes. As Maxwell is sworn by hair and makeup and the first AD off stage, contestant two appears on stage in plain clothes, a backpack over her shoulder. She takes a seat at a chair and types a login into a computer, waiting for it to boot up she takes a snack from her backpack, something that can be eaten silently, a banana or pita and hummus. She types into a computer again, accessing her email. Contestant one enters the stage in a robe, hair wrapped in a towel, carrying nail polishes. She sits on the floor, deciding between two very similar shades of dark blue. Contestant three enters, yoga mat in hand. She unfurls it across the floor. She pops her headphones on, searches through her phone for the perfect lo-fi beats to stretch to playlist. <laughs> Contestant four runs in, taking a seat on the chair, throwing her bag on the floor, turning her phone on to do not disturb. I'm so sorry I'm late. You are not going to believe this. Meanwhile, we see Contestant two has finally gotten her email to load. <sighs> Dear Miss Esta Adkins, thank you so much for your application after an overwhelming response from over uh, candidates. The field was highly competitive. As the scene occurs, contestant one's phone begins to vibrate. She struggles to put the phone to her ear as she balances wet nail polish brush in her hand. Hello? Yes, this is she. Oh, hello. Yes, yes, now's a great time. Uh-huh. Well, yes, of course, and I... Wait, what does that mean exactly? The woman sitting before you right now, the woman you have the distinct pleasure of sharing air with at this very moment, is officially in competition for this year's Miss Fortune 2023 pageant! Hold your applause. Okay, <laughs> okay, come on. We appreciate your time, passion, and bravery, and as such, it would be our pleasure to invite you to compete in this year's Miss Fortune pageant! Okay, a little applause would be nice. What? I, I thought you'd be happy for me. And favorite. Wait. So does that mean I'm in? Holy shit! Oh, fuck. Shit. Sorry. Oh, my bad. I'll keep it down. Hello? No, I haven't checked yet, Mom. I'll... What? How do you know? Fine, I'll check it now. Hold on. Yes, I'm refreshing. Uh, okay, here it is. Thank you so much for your application. I'm scrolling. Oh, here it is. It would be our pleasure to invite you to compete in this year's Miss Fortune pageant. Yeah, I, I got it. Okay, yes, yes, okay, okay. I love you too. Fuck. 
The anthemic pop sting brings us back from commercials. Maxwell is on stage in a new, shinier, sequin hair suit. <laughs> Swimsuits. Lights fade up slowly on an empty backstage area. Maybe some vanity mirrors with studio chairs. Contestants' names printed on the back of each one. Clothing racks with swimsuit dresses, high heels. We hear the first AD offstage. And we're back. Two minutes, people. Two minutes. Let's get these girls in swimsuits, yeah? And uh, can we get tissues or something for her? She's blubbering all over the stage. Uh, you're doing great. Here are cue cards for the next segment. We're, we're thinking five contestants enter the stage in gowns, all clearly from different budgets. All but contestant five begin to change into swimsuits. Silence, except for the sound of clothes being unzipped, exchanged on hangers, and contestant five, sobbing. God, these things are killer. Has anyone ever tried competing with whoever invented these as their abuser? A joke. Come on, lighten up. We're about to go out there in as little clothes as is allowed on cable TV. No need to be so sour about it. Ugh, whatever. Has anyone seen my baby oil? I can't believe they do this every year. Who is this for? What exactly is this supposed to prove? How fuckable we are. Or unfuckable. All right. The first day these voices heard again, with a warning. One minute! Trust me, you have a better chance of winning if the people watching want to fuck you. But not too much. Huh? If everyone wants to fuck you, well, you're a slut, and sluts don't win either. That's true. So, what's your number? You can tell me. I'll tell you mine. Seven. What, were you expecting more? Less? Oh, please, I'm not a dog. I've made it this far, haven't I? Plenty of boys I knew wanted to tap this, okay? <laughs> it wasn't them I ended up having to worry about anyways. It's a money grab. Hot, vulnerable woman in Axe body spray bikini needs more people watching the show, needs more money for Axe, needs more money for the show, needs more money for- Needs less for self-respect for us, we get it. Speak for yourself. I look good. <laughs> Excuse me? Why are you even here? You know, some of us are actually taking this competition seriously. So am I, and I know the path to the crown wasn't built on pouting. Whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, whatever. You think I'm here for attention, don't you? As if I haven't gotten enough of that already online. A final warning from the AD is heard. Can we get these girls lined up and get her out of here? Jesus. Sounds of applause as we return from the break. Welcome back, folks. The judges have narrowed down the competition to their top 10, which means we've reached the swimsuit round. Sponsored by Axe Body Spray. Four women. <laughs> Maxwell's big idea. Maxwell enters a much more business, Maxwell enters in a much more business appropriate suit. Stopping at the head of a boardroom table, throwing his briefcase down nonchalantly. He grips his phone as he talks, gesturing with it. Let's make this quick. I've got a, a meeting with the guys over at DraftKings in five and I'm sure I don't have to tell you, but you do not keep those guys waiting. Now, uh, how many messages have you gotten just in the past hour? And uh, you're saying that this is getting traction on, uh, right. And our strategy so far has been what exactly? Precisely, radio silence. You people think if we simply ignore the issue, ignore these feminists, carpet munching, bra burning, shoes at all, what? Back down? <laughs> give in? Give up? And find someone else's show to protest against? Oh, because that worked so well for us last year. Listen to me. Those girls with their liberal arts majors have nothing but time on their hands. <laughs> now I know what you're thinking. It, it's the same thing that Lawrence in marketing told me. As long as the viewership stays way, stays way above the number of people trying to tear us down, we have nothing to worry about. But Lawrence in marketing is a fucking idiot. And their numbers have nearly doubled in the past six months. Waiting for their numbers to match ours is not a viable strategy. Instead, we, we have to think outside the box. We have to get into the mind of our enemy. Huh? So what does the enemy want? What are their talking points? Well, yes, they, they want this pageant canceled once and for all, but I'll be damned if I give them that. We just got Evelyn into college, and is that, what, supposed to pay for itself? What else? Oh, the pageant always caters to cis, straight, blonde, white women. Boo-hoo! Why can't a girl like me win? Well, ratings, of course. <sighs> what? Is it her fault that, that they're more credible? 
I'm not the one telling you, poor little girl from some town I'm sure God's forgotten about, not to document any and all evidence of abuse you endure. I mean, the best way to win at all is to have nothing to compete for in this pageant in the first place. Learn to say no for once in a while, for heaven's sake. <laughs> but I digress. What they want is inclusivity. Sure. So, let's give it to them. We'll open up the pageant to all the races, the LGBTQ, and, and yes, even brunettes. <laughs> if I'm being honest, I don't know why we didn't open this up earlier. The trauma porn is going to boost our ratings! <laughs> now listen, they don't have to win the damn thing, but they'll have people tuning in, that's for sure. And think of the advertisers we could pull in. I bet Lawrence down in marketing never thought of that. <laughs> Welcome to dinner. Contestant one and three have already taken their assigned seats at the table, across from one another. The air is light but cautious. A banner hangs overhead that reads, Miss Fortune 2023, welcome lunch. I know it's bad, but I couldn't stop watching it. I mean, I believe her, obviously, and I hope she wins. I mean, she did win, in fact, in the first trial, but this case is pretty damning, and his lawyers are ruthless. I can't believe the way the judge lets him talk to her. I Contestant four enters, clearly eavesdropping, and takes an empty seat next to contestant one. Are you talking about the Crystal Cook case? Oh, yeah. I... Oh, I feel bad for the poor girl. With a name like that? Huh? Crystal Cook? Her parents might as well have named her Meth McGee. <laughs> Contestant three, chuckles at herself. Oh, you like that? I'm Priscilla Lay. Priscilla liked the queen of the desert and Lay like the chip. No relation though, trust me, I tried. <laughs> Contestant three shakes her hand, more out of politeness than fondness. Lori, it's nice to meet you. You too. And what about you, little Miss Thing? What's your name? Harlow. Hmm, you don't look like a Harlow to me. No? No, I would have named you Cleo, or, ooh, Rory. I'll be sure to let my parents know. Take, for instance, our new friend Lori here. She just looks like Lori, you know? I'm not sure I do. Look at her! Wholesome, refined, maybe a little simple. Simple? No, no, she has a point. And Rory, you see, <laughs> it's a bit more strong, a bit more youthful. Um, excuse me? And who's this now? Do you mind you're in my seat? Ooh, so serious. I was just trying to meet everyone. You know, let's go about the competition, sniff out any weak links. Oh yeah, and how's that going for you? Pretty well, actually. Enjoy your evening, Esta. It's Esta. Uh -huh. Question and answer. Maxwell and contestant one, two, and three, and four stand at the front of the stage. Maxwell dons another gaudy suit, the women in gowns. Welcome back to the show, ladies and gentlemen. We are down to our top four finalists. Let's hear it for our top four. I said, let's hear it for our top four. <laughs> we know it's been a long week of preliminary competition, but it's all come to this, the question and answer round. The judges will get a chance to ask you each a question, including questions from the audience submitted through the Miss Fortune app. And of course, your answers will help the judges select who will be crowned tonight. All right, ladies. Deep breaths. Lord, if you could join me over here, we have our first question. We hear offstage the voice of one of our judges. Uh, what does it mean to you to be the perfect victim? <laughs> Thank you for that question. <laughs> Good evening, ladies, gentlemen, and my distinguished panel of judges. It is my belief that the perfect victim lives a life abiding by what my mother, and I like to call the three Ps, poise, positivity, and, uh, um, well, you see, there's poise, of course. Uh, the perfect victim doesn't let her emotions get the best of her, but is able to uh, stay dignified and level-headed in the face of adversity, and of course, there's positivity, as I mentioned. Yes, positivity and reminding ourselves that the only way out is through. There's no use dwelling in negativity when we are reminded of God's plan for us all. And Lori, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but your time is almost up, and I want to make sure you get to that third P you mentioned. <laughs> yes, thank you, of course. The third P 
which stands for um, uh, <laughs> principles. <laughs> Having a strong moral compass, following your heart no matter what. Living a life guided by truth and authenticity because we only have one life to live and um, maybe it's a Maybe it's okay to admit when you're wrong. Thank you. Thank you. These girls are passionate folks. <laughs> Maybe that's the fourth P, huh? Passion. <laughs> now let's hear it from If Priscilla. I may, I would like to point out that while we use the word perfect to describe the women who compete on this stage, I think that it is okay for the perfect victim to be, well, imperfect. Oh. We are all, of course, <laughs> made in God's image. But none of us are without our faults. None of us are perfect. I don't think the wholeness of a perfect victim can be summed up in a one minute answer or a neat little acronym. But if I had to try, then I would say <laughs> to me, the perfect victim means someone who exemplifies resilience, bravery, modesty, and uses her voice for good. The perfect victim stands up for what's right, is caring, empathetic, and always humble. Thank you. Huh. Interesting. <laughs> You hear offstage the voice of another judge. Uh, thank you. My question for Esther is, what does justice mean to you? <laughs> Contestant two approaches Maxwell. It begins to answer, but we don't hear her voice, although her lips are moving. Instead, we hear the voice of Contestant one, her thoughts from backstage. Justice? Justice is a box grated with soft flesh between his legs. The sharp, shiny metal scraping across the skin just below his belly button peeling skin from muscle, exposing the veins and tendons, and scraping further still. The sound he makes as the cold, wet metal works his way further down to his fat, flaccid penis, holding it taut so the holes of the grater get a firm grip of him, rasping down and down and down again, down and down and down until there is only a little bit left, not enough that I can grate it again without catching my own skin in the blades. His penis, his power over me, in a heaping pile on the floor, <laughs> caught in the creases of the grater. I move on to the testicles. Peter left. He's unsure if I'm asking him which one to lose or to keep when really the question is, where would you like me to start? I get tired of waiting for an answer, grabbing both in one hand, tearing him open again. I take a pair of golf cleats to the back of his hands, the same hands that were happy to lead mine, to cradle the back of my head to explore my young body. I watch the nails rip, the bands of tissue pulled like taffy, the bones laid bare. Only then am I satisfied. Only then do I feel a modicum of justice. If I win, right. Contestant two and three stand backstage, picking over fruit and refreshment at the craft services at the craft services table. You look a lot like her, your mother. Yeah, I get that a lot. You don't sound happy about that. <clears throat> Yeah. And the judges are eating it up. Yeah, well... You know, if it isn't me who wins, I'd be happy if it was you. Okay, maybe not happy, but I think it would mean something. Yeah? To who? You, for one. I can't imagine going through all of this for nothing. And maybe seeing you winning, the daughter of a former winner, it will fucking... I don't know. Shit, this sounded better in my head two minutes ago. You really believe in all of this, huh? That this means something? Five women, four women? The great, emancipa uh, the great emancipator Maxwell Chandler. You buy into all of that. Listen, if I win, you should riot. If I win, it means I learn nothing from my mother. If I win, I'm paraded every morning, to, every morning show from here to Atlantic telling my story over and over and over again. Wait, what? I didn't sign up for... If I'm crowned, my mother will make sure of it. Trust me. And it's the, that is the last thing I want. She didn't deserve that. All the lies I've had to tell in order to be here, in order to make my mother happy, appease the neighbors, and finally give her something to brag about at the social club. No more talk on my summers away at conversion camp, no. After I'm crowned, after the press tour is over and the people are tired of my face, my voice, my story, I'll have to finally settle down with some rich, 
boring, jaw-squared husband who I regularly, re regularly have scheduled lights off, no noise sex with, and her two prized and a half children will look just like him, and every night, I'll pray that I won't wake up to see the sunrise. Justice? Maxwell, contestant three and her mother stand on stage. Young lady, I I'd like you to think right now about what you're doing, what your mother fought for and competed for. Do you even care about what you're storing away? If you walk away right now, you can say goodbye to anyone caring about whatever happened to you, to any dreams or justice or- I don't need justice from her. For her? Who is justice even for? I don't need her to feel exactly how scared and hurt I felt when it happened. I told her and she apologized. I saw it in her face, felt it in the way her hand moved from my thigh back to her own. Is it so wrong? You just want to move on and forget anything, any of it ever happened. I forgave her and we continued to hook up. Yes, she said she got caught up in the moment and she thought that maybe I was into it. She wouldn't let it happen again. Not like she had much of a choice once my mother found out. How do I receive justice when there's no room for it? When any chance of reparations, restoration is taken from you, from her, from me, is that fair? Where's the justice there? When I'm forced to deny myself, to deny the one person who carried my heart in her hands and kissed it goodnight, who held me and hurt me to thrust both of us in a spotlight neither of us asked for and weave a tale of the poor young virgin who was brought into the cities of the plain and the wicked temptress who led her there. Will there be justice for me in heaven? Some people will say that I'm lucky. Some women who have competed, they knew that the harm done to them was meant for them. It was so specific and cruel, it makes it that much harder when they lose. I have been hurt by people who didn't mean to and people who knew exactly what they were doing. This wasn't even my idea. I never wanted any of this, digging up old tax countless psych appointments because God forbid I show a hint of instability, smile and not too much less, having just survived a traumatic experience that has no doubt left me with this lasting impressions mentally, spiritually, emotionally. I don't appear to com in complete control of myself, of my emotions. Do not cry too much, but also don't shut down completely. And for what? Justice? None of this undoes what happened to me. Is it the ratings? We're all just cash cows you milk to sell toothpaste and Taco Bell. How much money do you guys make off of the betting sites, huh? I've got some odds for you. Your daughter is five times likely than you to be sexually assaulted in her life. It happens every 17 minutes. How, much, how long have you been on air? But as long as your check clears and the people at home are turning in, right? Aren't you embarrassed? Aren't you both embarrassed? This year, our first ever legacy contestant, as if that's not the entire problem, that since my mother won all those years ago, nothing has changed. I don't think that she meant to hurt me. I'll never know for sure. I guess there is some solace in the mystery. But you two, you know exactly what you're doing. What the fuck? <laughs> Can I ask you guys something? Sure, I love the sound of my own voice. <laughs> Why are you here? And not the rehearsed pageant answer. I mean, seriously. Because sometimes I... I know how the other girls talk about me when I'm not around, and sometimes I... It's... I'm not sure I'm the person to ask about this. I... Okay, well... What's supposed to happen? When we win, you know? Because I keep having this nightmare where I'm crowned and you know the world validates me like they're supposed to. They all stand up and say, this shouldn't have happened to you. No if, and, or buts. Just, we see this happened to you and we believe you and we're sorry. And even the people, the men, the boys who hurt me, they apologize. Really apologize with regret and responsibility and repentance. And I feel 
nothing. The same nothing I've felt since the first boundary was crossed, before I could describe it in any shared language. The void that opened when it was only a vocabulary of feelings, sensations, whispers in the dark, mouths and muscle, flesh and tension, a hollow that I can't shake and grinds my bones to dust. And I just, I don't know if I can keep doing this, keep giving myself to these people. I need to know that competing won't take everything in me only to take almost everything from me. I need to know that this will all be worth it. I, I was born after my mom competed. <coughs> I'm told she was a very different person before it all. She was unstoppable. She was impossible to tie down, and only the wind knew where she was. She didn't like to talk about it until I... Her mouth would go dry at the mere mention of it. But she still kept the shoebox under her bed with all the memories of her time competing. The faded Polaroids, the sworn statements, the hospital records. It's so stupid because if she hadn't compete, maybe she, she didn't get religious until the pageant. Would pray for hours to be crowned, promise to serve with all she had if she won. She knew that people who watched, the people who cared, well, they were more receptive to a woman who knew God, truly knew him. Surely a woman who had accepted Jesus as her Lord and Savior would be credible. She couldn't let, she couldn't let it go though. When she'd won, she'd pledged herself. You see, that's the part of winning no one tells you about. You have to stay credible. So by the time that she had me, by the time I was old enough to, homosexuality, homosexuality is a sin, and so I deserve what happened to me because I had let Mel lead me into temptation. And the only way to repent, the only way to get out of another summer of praying the gay away was to compete and win. So that's why I'm here. And my mother, well, she goes to church every Sunday and has a gay daughter who hates her. A daughter that she wasn't able to protect from the very thing that tore her apart. But hey, at least everyone can agree that she was indeed torn apart in the first place and yeah, you know what? Maybe she didn't deserve it after all. I wouldn't worry about the other girls, by the way. We're all fucked. Some of them just haven't realized it yet. Then why do we, why does any? Because we want justice. Because we want to be believed. Because we don't think it's fair that these people get to live lives unaffected by their actions while we struggle to live a life despite what they did to us. Oh, yeah, of course. But only one of us gets crowned. That's the point of it all. We hoist up these women who dared to compete and win, but shame the women who dared to compete and lose. There's rarely much difference between the two. It's scary to think about the 15 discarded voices at the end of it all. The thousands of others who didn't even make it to the stage. I remember my mother telling me that she thought it would make all the girls catty competing against one another like this. And for some, it did. But more often than not, the competition connects them in a way that only they know. The women that held my mother's hands backstage, hoping against all hope that their story sounded a bit more credible than hers, their voices a bit steadier, I wonder about them. Wish they'd won instead. Well, I still think. I've known since I was a child that I was vulnerable, and I've known just as long that it wouldn't matter. According to almost every statistic available for a woman of my age, ethnicity, and history, this is just what happens to us. And that's fine. I mean, it's not that I internalized it for so long that when it did finally happen, I was... It didn't knock me off my feet like I thought it would. Sometimes it even felt good to have him pay attention to me. Because I've been taught that I'm equally as sexualized as I am undesirable. The contradiction of being a racialized woman. And so it feels important to be here. To compete. To win. This can't mean nothing, because for me, seeing someone like me win would have meant everything. Um.